In 2008, former Apple creative director and Netscape vice president Hugh Dubberly wrote an article titled Design in the Age of Biology for an issue of Interactions magazine. In the article, he implored designers and educators alike to recognize the paradigm shift taking place in emerging design practice. According to Dubberly, in the modern era, Design practice adopted something of the point of view or philosophy of manufacturing, a mechanical object ethos. Emerging design practice is adopting something of the point of view or philosophy of software and service development, an organic systems ethos. This shift in ethos, Dubberly argued, requires a shift in language. It requires new framing metaphors to describe emerging design practice, from mechanical clockworks to biological ecologies. Typography and typeface design are disciplines firmly rooted in the industrial era. In fact, the introduction of printing with movable type to Europe nearly 600 years ago helped to usher in the mechanical age. Despite the mechanical nature of this paradigm-shifting technology, from its beginning, typographic design practitioners have mixed the language of mechanical clockworks with biological framing metaphors. One cannot practice typographic design without referring to type faces and letter form anatomy. French engraver Geoffrey Torrey took these metaphors to an extreme when, in 1529, he depicted proportional relationships between letter forms and the human face, as well as between letter forms and the human body. This could indicate that typographic designers were five centuries early in recognizing the need doubly identified in his article. More likely, it indicates that these early printers and typeface designers were looking backward, to the pre-modern era, attempting to maintain a visual and verbal connection to the labor-intensive manual tasks they were beginning to automate. In the early 20th century, Francis Thibodeau, creator of the Thibodeau classification system, one of the first typeface classification systems, compared the classification of typefaces to that of plants and animals, and warned that grafting together various species of typeface would lead to the creation of typographic monstrosities. The examples he produced presaged the postmodern hybridization of digital type in the 1990s, which we will return to momentarily. Two additional mechanical age premonitions of contemporary typeface design in the age of biology can be found in the work of American designers William Addison Dwiggins and Oswald Cooper. Dwiggins, who is credited with coining the term graphic design, must have been a lover of anthropomorphization. He built marionettes in his spare time and eventually adapted his technique into a system of constructing typefaces from simple components. Dwiggins described the so-called M formula in a letter to fellow typeface designer Rudolf Ruzitska in 1940. This componentized approach to typeface design foreshadows postmodern deconstruction, but also contemporary parametric approaches to designing type. Around the same time, 
a wizard named Oz was experimenting with typefaces in a way that could be viewed as the genesis of the idea of variable fonts. Oswald Cooper is best known for his eponymous typeface that's nearly as ubiquitous as Helvetica. But in a pamphlet produced in 1936, he demonstrated the ways in which serif styles influenced the visual qualities of a typeface by subtly modifying only the terminals of a plain sans serif typeface with 15 different serif styles. Oz was first and foremost a lettering artist, and the Cooper typeface family was his only original typeface. His connection to hand lettering allowed him to see the potential for fluid, mutable letter form boundaries that metal type did not allow, and that only recent digital technology has made possible. It's no surprise then that Cooper's serif experiment is now a digital tool available to anyone. Prototypo allows present day designers to choose from so called font templates and then parametrically alter the templates to suit their needs. According to Matthew Carter, in the early 90s, there was an explosion of experimental type design because of the coming of the personal computer. More specifically, it was provoked by the arrival of an open version of the PostScript Type 1 format, so that you, sitting at your kitchen table with a Mac, could sit down and make a typeface that would display or render exactly the same as an Adobe typeface or a Bitstream typeface. This was referred to at the time as the democratization of type design. Everyone designed a typeface in the early 90s. For many, this new technology didn't lead to designing new typefaces from scratch. Rather, they opened pre-existing font files and began to hybridize typefaces together exactly in the way Thibodeau warned against 70 years earlier. Fudoni is one such example. According to its publisher Font Shop, Fudoni is an irreverent brute made by slicing parts of two of perhaps the most commonly used typefaces in the world, Bodoni and Futura. They were put together in a nightmarish configuration that could have only been conceived by Matt Kinsman. Fudoni was published in 1991, a year after P. Scott Makala's Dead History was published by Emigre. Perhaps the most well-known typeface hybridization, Dead History combines Volkswagen's corporate typeface with Linotype Centennial, and it was intended to signal the end of an era of traditionally designed fonts, according to Emigre. Dead History personifies a new attitude in type creation marked by the design of hybrid typefaces which are largely the result of the computer's capabilities to function as the perfect assembling tool. Matthew Carter, already an established designer of traditional fonts, found himself swept up in the experimentation as one of his most well-known typefaces, Galliard, was deconstructed and re-released as Retrospecta by one of his students at Yale. Christian Coosters. Carter also participated in the digital experimentation by doing exactly what Thibodeau warned against. For his redesign of the Walker Art Center visual identity system, Carter devised the Walker typeface system, which allowed for different styles of serifs to be snapped onto glyphs at will. A word, or even an individual letter form, could contain multiple different serif styles. Again, according to Carter, these kinds of experiments weren't popular with tradition-loving design critics and historians. Citing an iMagazine article by Stephen Heller titled The Cult of the Ugly, in which Heller stated they were examples of freakishness as an end in itself, as evidence of the backlash. In the article, Heller called the typeface luscious a body, shove-it-in-your-face novelty typeface, and an affront to, not a parody of, typographic standards. 
While these hybridized typefaces looked strange to many in print, they seemed to be a natural fit for a new wave of title sequence designers. In the 1990s, designers such as Kyle Cooper and his Imaginary Forces studio fused hybridized and grungy experimental typefaces into the imagery, setting the type in motion and taking one step closer to something that resembled a typographic organism, as twisted and monstrous as Thibodeau had feared. In certain instances, the title sequence outperformed the film itself. The Island of Dr. Moreau, released in 1996 and starring Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer, would likely be forgotten entirely were it not for the effective use of a deconstructed, mutated version of the serif typeface Bembo to complement the quick cuts of disturbing biomorphic imagery. In the mid-1980s, Bruce Mao Design began working with a new publishing venture called Urzone to launch a new cultural journal. Six issues of the journal were published over the next decade or so, and the last issue featured an early attempt at what Mao later referred to as font breeding. The final issue, titled Incorporations, was based on the notion that all things emerge, evolve, and pass away by incorporating and being incorporated into other emerging, evolving, and disintegrating structures. The cover attempts to embody this notion by playing with the interactions of four related sans-serif typefaces. For the interior of the journal, Mao and his team created the Zone Morph, a running head that gradually morphed from one typeface into another and then back to the original. According to Mao, the end result is 380 new fonts. Every page has a unique rendering of the word zone that's different from that of the page before it. Mao's team used animation software, possibly an early version of Flash, to accomplish the morph. The slight imperfections of the morphed typefaces were imperceptible due to the number of in-between states. At about the same time, Bruce Mao Design was also working on an identity system for the newly constructed Walt Disney Concert Hall, designed by Frank Gehry. Again, according to Mao, we began by using animation techniques to produce an exclusive font. It was a technique that we evolved during Zone 6. The resulting font was titled a font called Frank. This time, Mao embraced the imperfections resulting from the morphing process in order to express the essential characteristics of Gary's design, humanity, originality, and wit. At smaller sizes, the typeface looks fairly normal. But at the scale of the architectural signage, the idiosyncrasies become more obvious. In a bid to rebrand Universal Pictures in 1996, Mao described the morphing technique he pioneered as font breeding, a biological framing metaphor, if there ever was one. The bid was unsuccessful, but the concept of font breeding resonated with me two decades later when I began researching new approaches to typeface design. My problem with Mao's approach is most clearly evident in his demonstration of font breeding included in the failed Universal Pictures rebrand. The children of the two mated fonts are formally and technically imperfect. My goal is formal and technical perfection. In order to breed fonts that produce formally and technically imperfect offspring, the problem of compatibility needs to be addressed. Specifically, the question is, why do certain letter forms tend to produce deformities when they mate? The answer is unequal anchor points. These two parent O's produce a deformed child O 
because the parent on the left contains five more anchor points than the parent on the right. Once anchor points are added to the parent on the right, the resulting child is a more formally and technically perfect offspring of its parents. Even serif and sans serif typefaces can mate, as demonstrated here by Eric Gill's eponymous Gill Sans, which I successfully mated with Petter van Blocklin's Proforma to produce a child I called Gilforma. Once the unequal anchor point problem is resolved, almost any two typefaces are compatible so long as they don't contain letter forms that are completely different shapes. Gilforma is an interesting blend of humanist sans serif and old style serif that is ready to use with little or no adjustments. Like Bruce Mao's font called Frank, Gilforma has numerous idiosyncrasies present in the parent typefaces. Unlike a font called Frank, however, these unusual features appear to be intentional rather than accidental. My process is manual, because having been educated by those who were educated at the end of the mechanical age, I lack the expertise necessary to automate the process. With the help of designers and developers firmly rooted in the age of biology, it would be possible to automate the process to allow any two typefaces to breed with little effort. By further automating that breeding process, a font repository such as Google Fonts could become a typeface breeding ground wherein typefaces are born rather than designed. You may have heard it said, and you may believe, that there are too many fonts in the world already. The last thing we need are more fonts. If I have my way, in the near future, the fonts may have the ability to disagree with you. I would like to thank the Surface Conference Planning Team for putting this conference together and for allowing me to present my work in this format. If there are any comments or questions regarding the presentation, it is my understanding that someone here will pass those along to me. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, my email is the best way to reach me. Thank you. Thank you.